how to successfully start a family business around your art career. You've brought yeah. all of your family members together. I could pay you 50 bucks a week. <laughs> Really good. I mean, any MBA would know that that's a very good business model. Hey, mom, you need to get an Instagram account. And I was like, I don't know. You give them a title yeah. and you give them power and you give them authority. You have to really mm -hmm. sell the vision of the position to the family member that you're working with. Welcome back to another episode of the Light Movement Podcast. This is the podcast where we discuss how to be successful as an artist without selling your soul to the dark art elitist system. So in this episode, I am here. My name's Jake Dunn. I'm the host with Ellie Milan, founder of Milan Art, um, the ultimate artist enterprise uh, mm -hmm. where we have an artist social media platform. We have the ultimate artist education, you know, different platforms for artists in that. We have an art store, an art gallery, all things art. She is the founder and Ellie is the matriarch of this entire enterprise. And I am her son-in-law and I will be interviewing her and we'll be discussing how to successfully start a family business around your art career. So it's going to be really interesting. All right, Ellie, just for context for the viewers, you are my mother-in-law. We operate a family business together. We have um, you as sort of the visionary. I'm sort of uh, the marketing director for the business. Co-visionary. Co-visionary. We're both leaders in the business. We have, you know, several other people involved. My brother-in-law, your other son-in-law. Elijah is, you know, another co-owner of the business. Dimitro, my wife, uh, your daughter, your oldest daughter is a co-owner of the business. Your husband's a co-owner of the business. Daphne, one of your other daughters, is a mentor for the mastery program. Um, Dahlia was a mentor for the mastery program. Now she's just focusing on her art career. Dino, he works in customer service and he has his own art career. So, I mean, all members of the family essentially are involved in the business. Um, but it didn't, it wasn't always this big. It wasn't always this, you know, um, multifaceted, uh, you know, involved in many different verticals uh, business. It kind of started smaller. So in this podcast, you know, we're going to talk about um, how an artist can get started in creating a family business around their art and kind of involving family members into their art to develop their own business and, um, you know, really utilizing and bringing family members together because that's what you've done. You've brought yeah. all, all of your family members together. So could you just Tell us how it got started. Like, where was, where did this begin? I think it started by uh, when we opened the school. Mm -hmm. um, up until that point, I didn't think of um, ourselves in terms of, like, our kids being artists and legacy and all that because they were younger. And, of course, they painted with us. They were involved when we traveled um, for art-related things. They would come with us. Um, they always came with us. Uh, so they were always pretty involved, but it, when it really kind of started to materialize is when they were older. So Dimitri was about 12, Daphne was 10, Dolly was eight, hmm. Dino six. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's about when we opened the art school. Dimitra didn't really work for us at all. She's always been, um, I don't think Dimitra technically has ever worked for us. It's like <laughs> the, from the time Dimitra got involved, we were partners. Mm -hmm. So Dimitra always worked for herself. And then, uh, and then once she was, you know, really successful there, she started to feel that tug, like, I want to, I want to give back. I want to do more. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then she became a partner. Uh, so, but Daphne had a knack for organization and she wanted to make extra side money because she kind of saw Dimitra just started selling her paintings and, and it wasn't like on a large scale. She would just sell them for like, you know, a couple hundred bucks and it was here and there. It's like the local markets and yeah, stuff, Yeah, local right? markets and different mm -hmm. things. Anyway, so Daphne wanted to make money and she told me one day when I, she was watching me clean up the studio and I was complaining that I could never find scissors and I kept buying new scissors, but then I couldn't find them. She was like, uh, mama, why don't you buy like a plastic bin and get a marker and some tape and just write scissors on one of the drawers and just put your scissors in there. And I was like, oh my God, she's a genius. Like, <laughs> whoa. I've raised a prodigy. <laughs> I, I know. Like she, she could just run the world, you know? So I was like, Daphne, how would you like to be, you know, the studio director? How would you mm -hmm. like to, you know, manage the studio? And I said, I could pay you 50 bucks a week. And you could just make sure everything's in its place and everything's labeled. You can organize it all yourself. And she was excited about it. And she was excited about 50 bucks a week. And 
Um, so yeah, that's kind of like, you know, and then she kind of progressed in, cause in homeschooling, um, she needed to kind of get better at writing. And I was trying to find practical ways to help her write at a higher level. Hmm. So, uh, she started doing my emails for me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and then I taught her how to you know, do the website. Then she started building websites for the students. And so it just kind of, you know, happened that way. Daphne and Dimitra actually, I don't know if you know this, they started a business together. Mm -hmm. She told you. And well, you, I, I want to hear it from your perspective though, because I've only heard it from Dimitra's pr perspective. Uh, well, that would be interesting. <laughs> um, from my perspective, they, uh, they were just making all these crafts and um, one would kind of make earrings and another one would make like crazy quilted wallets and then somebody else would do um, hair barrettes and they were learning, you know, from YouTube how to make these different things and then they would go buy the materials. Actually, I would buy the materials. They had a racket going. I would buy the materials and then they would, um, you know, make the stuff and then they would sell. Mm -hmm. So after a while though, they were making really good money. So I, I was like, okay, from now on, you guys have to buy your own materials. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my mom, uh, Harriet, she, who you know, she <laughs> helped Daphne make a spreadsheet and uh. calculate out like her cost for things and then what she made. And Daphne was like serious about it with her spreadsheets. and Wow. Yeah. And then Dimitra had a very, very uh, successful streak with dog treats. Did she tell you about her dog yeah, treat? Yeah, and yeah. actually we, I, I tried to get my younger brother, Marcus, um, to start selling dog treats and start his own dog treat business. Yeah. Because uh, he's only 10, you know. Yeah, and, he or, could totally do that. Yeah, he's about to turn 11. And but, Jordan could totally help him. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and it's very, very low cost mm -hmm. product, you know. So, um, I actually, I, I didn't buy the the materials for him though. I was like, if you're going to do this, you know, we took him to Sprouts and we were like, you got to do organic dog treats. Cause that's, you that's know, what's going to sell. You got to yeah. know your clientele and that's your, right. your neighborhood. And these people are going to want organic treats for their dogs. Um, cause they live in a pretty nice neighborhood. And, um, anyways, that's, yeah. Well, even back then, Dimitra was so into the packaging mm -hmm. and she really like packaged it all really well and came up with these cool names. Um, she had ones called, um, what was it called? Snicker poodles or something like that. So <laughs> snicker doodles. And then she made some that had um, activated charcoal in them. Oh, wow. So that the dogs would have like good breath. And yeah, it was cool. Wow. She, yeah, she would sell like a, a box of them for like 20, 20 bucks or something. Yeah. And I think the profit, it was like $24 and then the profit on it was like 20. Yeah. So every time she sold a box, she made 20 bucks. Yeah. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really good. I mean, any MBA would know that that's a very good business model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apple would be jealous of the profit margins. <laughs> well, and kids have an edge because as soon as you see a, a kid or a teenager or a 10-year-old in a lemonade stand, I mean, the first thing you want to do is support them. Yeah, so, you want to give them your money. That's like, right. You don't even care, really. You're like, $24 dog treats? Go Heck for yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that's why I tried to tell Marcus too. I'm like, you need to do this now while you're young because you can milk it. <laughs> like yeah. Everyone wants to buy from a young person. As soon as you turn 18, nobody won't, nobody will touch you. They're like, what are you doing? Why aren't you in school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So just kind of breaking it down, um, how you kind of got your family involved. It sounds like what you did was identified um, some of the problems that you had, right? Mm -hmm. Some issues, which was organization and Daphne's case with the studio. And then you identified a, like the, the strengths within your children and really like helped build them up through like projects that were associated with what you were doing. Yeah. I think cause we, we started homeschooling about the same time mm -hmm. and I started teaching homeschool classes at the school um, and so I got immersed cause I was actually anti homeschooling <laughs> and I thought, I don't know, I, I had weird ideas, but, uh, I've totally come around. So I started to meet all these homeschool kids and their parents and I saw, whoa, there, there's something really different going on here. And these kids are so bright and so articulate and, uh, just totally different. And, and so I wanted that for my kids. So I think in homeschooling, um, because if you're around homeschoolers, everything they do, they want to turn it into like school or a lesson or, or, 
a learning opportunity. Yeah. And so uh, we started doing that. And then by the time they got done at the end of homes- homeschooling and and Dahlia was like maybe 15, Dimitri had already graduated, I was realizing even the homeschool curriculum's dumb. Like you can just fold your kids into your family business and they'll learn way more than they would in school. Yeah, seriously, because yeah. schools don't teach you anything really no. about how to actually run a business yeah or to function within a business other than, you know, being able to work from nine to five. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was just also finding opportunities for them to learn. And then as soon as money became involved and, you know, Dimitra was making her own money, Daphne was making money and earning money. um, And then Daphne also started selling her art. Uh, Dahlia's like, hmm, I think I want to earn some money. (laughs) What can I do? And then mm-hmm. Dino, of course, what can I do? And so, you know, it it's like if you can get one hooked on working and making their own money, you know, yeah. and then you never have to buy your kids anything. They just, <laughs> they buy it themselves, you know. Exactly. And it's honestly, it's so healthy, mm-hmm. I think, like as a, as a model for parenting because it really fosters self-responsibility or like, you know, just responsibility in general and um, understanding the worth of things, yeah. you know, like when you're a kid and your parents buy you stuff all the time, you know, that's why kids break things because they don't understand that, you know, that parent had to put in X amount of time to earn that money to buy that thing for their kid. Um, whereas if the kid knows that, you know, oh man, if I break this, I'm going to have to go and work, you know, this right. much time in order to get this back again, then they really value their their possessions more and their time too. Totally. And, so yeah, I think it's and really good. And I think now, like for for people listening, if they if they have kids that are you know, I don't know, ten, nine, up to you know, teenagers, mm-hmm. it's such an asset because I'm I sort of missed the window of like I wasn't aware of social media helping businesses when I was first starting the business. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of wasn't on the scene. Like I didn't even know about. I was on Facebook, but like everybody else on Facebook, you know, to keep up with or meet, you know, reconnect with old high school friends. You know, it wasn't, a I tool. didn't, yeah, it wasn't a tool. I didn't have a Facebook page for the school, which is, I look back on that now and think that was dumb, but I didn't. Um, well, they might not have had Facebook pages back then. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I don't know. I didn't use social media as a tool. The first time I even woke up to that idea was Demetra was telling me about it. Mm-hmm. And she, she was probably 15. Um, she got an Instagram and we saw it like explode. And then she, she was saying, you yeah, mom, you need to get an Instagram account. And I was like, ah, I don't know. Like th- that's for you kids. But if, if that window was like now, oh my gosh, we use that stuff all the time and digital yeah. everything. And so it hit Dino because he started editing, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of like his early, you know, foray. Into yeah, yeah. The business. yeah. And I used to, when, um, I remember when Dino was about 12, I had my Instagram and it was fairly new. And that was when you could follow and unfollow people. Mm -hmm. And so I... I, (laughs) (laughs) The old hacks. (laughs) I know. Like now you get shadow banned. You can't do that. But this is before they put any restrictions. So I initially got like 6,000 followers without any problem just paying Dino to follow and unfollow all day. (laughs) And I would be like, Dino, Dino, get my phone. Follow and unfollow, you know. (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, it's true. I mean, that's what so many people used to do to initially get noticed, you know, within Instagram. Yeah, Yeah. because I had to get on the map. I mean, my daughter had like, 60,000 followers mm-hmm. and I had none. So You're like paying Dimitra for sponsorship deals. Like, <laughs> all right, Dimitra, if you just post me on your story, then I'll give you 50 bucks for each post on your oh, story. Yeah. <laughs> or she's doing a story and I jump in there. <laughs> Make me. sure to tag me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So I think it, for us, it was really natural. I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't have a calculated... If I knew what I knew now, I would have had it calculated. That's, That's what I'm in the position I'm in. I'm like, yeah. all right, I can't wait to have seven children so that yeah, each yeah. one of them. I'm just right. Kidding. No, it's, and I think that's how it used to be. Family mm-hmm. businesses were, it's such a natural, normal thing. Yeah. Um, that's how you end up with the last name Smith, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Family businesses were, I, I think we've lost that. Yeah. You know, and, and if I, if I could tell you how many people warned me and told me, don't get involved with family. Don't have a family business, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, you have a family business, you know? 
or whenever we talk to an accountant or yeah. a lawyer or yeah. whoever, oh, yeah. someone who's like on the more like professional side of business, uh, that's like, wow, I'm surprised you guys have been able to run a family business. Like yeah. most family businesses I see are in complete disarray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think art too, like really unifies us and we all have a common vision mm -hmm. and we, I mean, we each have our own part in it and our unique vision, but there's, there's so much overlap. I think that that's what makes it work. So do you think that if they weren't homeschooled, it would have like, you would have been able to do this or the same sort of thing? Like, like if someone, let's say someone's watching this and mm -hmm. you know, they really love the idea of involving their family in their business. They have four kids, three kids, whatever. Um, and you know, they're at just the right age and they understand social media at any, whatever, you know, someone's watching this, they're thinking, okay, I, I know exactly how I would involve my kids, but their kids are in school for most of the time. Yeah. How do you think, like, first, do you think it's possible? And second, do you, like, how would you recommend someone going about involving their family and their business in that sense? Yeah, I think that's a really good practical question. I think, of course, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely, if even if your kid's in, in school and in sports, you know, you could involve them. Mm -hmm. um, they may have less time. They might be less inclined. I think you have to kind of shift away from, it might be tough if you have uh, somebody that's, you know, a child that's like really involved in sports and then, you know, very studious and does their homework and is, you know, kind of uh, almost at that point of burnout to put one more thing on them is yeah. going to probably be, and especially if you're in the habit of sort of buying things for them mm. and they aren't in the habit of like making their own money and having to buy it themselves. I think then it's a big shift. Uh, but I think that if you're, you have a child that's sort of looking for something anyway, um, they're struggling in school to sort of find their purpose or where they fit. Uh, if their friend groups are sort of either conducive to, you know, that kind of thing, um, cause you can even involve their friends and then they're more likely to do it because they get to do it with their friends. I mean, we hired our kids' friends for stuff, whether it was cleaning stalls or, <laughs> um, you know, whatever, you know, cleaning studios, helping making canvases. I would, I would just pay them, you know, by the hour. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's, it's easier to get your kids involved. Um, so I do think it's possible, but I think it's more possible and a little bit easier if they are homeschooled because then the whole dynamic changes and some kids don't, if they're used to being in school, don't want to be homeschooled, you know, because they have all their friends at school. Yeah. They want to do the sports and all the, you know, clubs and stuff that school provides. So, um, but I, but I think there's a whole population out there of kids that want to get out of school. It's like, ugh, just boring them. Yeah. And COVID really like Exposed it. Yeah, exposed exactly yeah. that, you know, school is kind of a sham in terms of like you having to sit in a classroom and in order to get assignments, like, no, you can just right. go online and, you know, it's Be all the done curriculum. way faster. Yeah. Most of the teachers aren't really teaching. They're just yeah. kind of guiding. And even in that case, I mean, I don't want to put all teachers down. I'm not saying like all teachers. Right. I, I certainly had fantastic teachers throughout mm -hmm. school and I was so blessed. But I heard from so many friends, so many people, really the consensus, the consensus out there for a lot of people is that most teachers don't even really want to be teaching. So right. like it, I'm talking about the teachers who don't want to be teaching. I so. have several teacher friends yeah. and none of them want to be teaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, and and point. we have a lot of students, uh, you know, we have art art teachers or, or teachers that are students. And the first thing on their list is I want to be free and paint. Do they hate their job totally? And are they bad teachers? I'm not saying that probably not. Um, they're sucking it up, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of teachers would prefer doing other things, but that's most people working. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So it sounds like in order, it, it, if your kids are in school and they are really busy, Sounds like the best ways to find a passion of theirs that kind mm -hmm. of overlaps with something that you're doing. Yeah. Or if, you know, they haven't found their passion yet, try to help them find it through working with you, you know? Yeah. And I know you would definitely agree with me here and mm -hmm. you would probably have a lot to add to this, but it's sort of like, um, you know, you got to, you got to sell it. Yeah, totally. So as a parent, if you're like, um, Hey, Jimmy, I'm just, you know, I'm so terrible at all this technology stuff. And, you know, uh, could you just do it for me? And, you know, I'm, I'll pay you a little bit, you know, like he's not going to want to do that. Yeah. But 
if you, if you're like, Hey, how would, like I told Daphne, how would you like to be the studio manager? Mm -hmm. You know, if you give them a title yeah. and you give them power mm -hmm. and you give them authority, yeah. it can be limited at first and then they can grow and earn it. Um, but I, it's like, Daphne, you are now in charge of the scissors. That is your realm. Yeah. You know, you got to give them a realm. So, um, you know, Hey, Jimmy, how would you like to be a media manager? You know, Whoa. it's like, he Tanner, can, they're going to replace you. Jimmy's going to replace you. <laughs> <laughs> but now 12 year old Jimmy is in charge of organizing all the content photos is, you know, and you give yeah. him a plan, you give him a task list, just like you would an employee, you exactly. know, Exactly. and yeah. then, and you sort of check up on them. You reward them when they do well. You work together and give them autonomy, give them creativity, uh, and then praise them and give them recognition uh, when they do well. You're going to have, Jimmy is going to be, you know. Better than probably a lot of people that you right. would go out into the marketplace to hire. That's right. Yeah. And you have to stop momming Jimmy. They have to be, you know, your employee. Maybe not even that. It's more like you're their leader. Yeah. You're their leader and and you're trying to you're looking at them from the eyes of a business owner. How can how can I encourage them and get the best out of them? And and instead of being a mom and already suspicious of every time I ask him to clean his room, he doesn't do it. So he probably won't do my videos. Mm -hmm. Like you can't carry all that over because nobody wants to clean their room. Who wants to clean their room? Yeah. I mean, maybe 5% of the population actually wants to clean their room. But to be a media manager, have autonomy, know I'm in charge of this. This is where my boundaries are. This is what I get to do. Um, and if I hit these deadlines, I will be rewarded, blah, blah, blah. It That, that will work. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And if you really sell them on the value of it, like you said, it's it all kind of comes down to sales, really. Mm -hmm. Like in, I mean, in most aspects of life, whether you like it or not, you're constantly selling people. Totally. Whether it's, you know, your wife or husband uh, and, you know, you want to go to this restaurant to eat dinner there or you're, you know, trying to decide on a vacation or you're, you know, hiring your son Jimmy to be your media manager or trying to hire him. Right. Right. You have to outline what's in it for them yeah. and like really be empathetic to them mm -hmm. and like show them the value that this position will bring to them. Really, it's like, it's almost like, um, you know, it makes me think of Tom Sawyer with the white picket fences. And he's like talking about how much fun he's having painting the fences and, oh, it's such a good thing. And then he gets all the other kids to paint the fences for him because he, you know, showed that it was so much fun to do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. I think that as a parent or as a leader of your business, yeah, really, um, yeah. you, you should be really passionate and excited about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want Jimmy to be your media manager, um, you know, it's like you have the opportunity to influence and touch people every single day. Mm -hmm. We're going to do great things together. Here's what we're going to do, you know, and, and be passionate about it instead of like transferring your frustration about technology and editing and, yeah. and knowing how to work your phone onto poor Jimmy, who, was born knowing how to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think being passionate and excited and always pulling purpose and vision into what it is you want your family to do with you. Mm -hmm. You're all in this together and and this is the vision. You're the CEO mm -hmm. and you are, you know, uh, casting the vision for them and it has to be cast in a way that they can get involved too and not all about you, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, we're going to change people's lives. We're going to touch people and you get to be a part of that. And, you know, it's going to be great instead of you're going to make me famous and I will get lots of free lipstick out of it. And I mean, it's like, <laughs> that's not who cares. Jimmy's Imagine how great it's going to be when I'm an influencer. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. And if they're old enough, I think they can, they can, um, I don't know if 12, maybe it depends on the person, but I, I, when they're older, I think you can also sell it in what this, what this could do for them in the future. Yeah. You know, like you'll be able to put on your college resume, you'll be able to, you know, in your, you know, when you start a business, you will have your own. And, mm -hmm. and so then it really gives them purpose and identity as like, I'm not just doing something for mom cause she can't do it. And, you know, maybe she'll throw me 10 bucks here and there. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is your salary or this is your hourly wage. And it's, it's, you know, treat it like a real business and this will go on your resume and, you know, in the future, it'll help you in, in this way. Yeah. And I think that's like the best way to really involve your kids yeah. and teach them about business at the same time. 
I completely agree. And, and I think another key component and that kind of selling aspect too is, is really understanding the language of your child and like mm. what incentivizes them to, because some children might be incentivized by money, like, cause they have things that they want to buy. Right. Some kids might not even know what they want to buy or what, know what to do with money. And they're more excited by the idea of creating something. Yeah. Some kids might, you know, be excited by having other people praise what they've created, you know? So it's, you, you kind of just have totally. to, it's like, I mean, it's really so beneficial because you get to understand your child on a deeper level and totally. have like a much richer relationship when you're working with them, which is completely contrary to, you know, the mainstream idea of having a family business and that, you know, things always get muddled and um, unclear. It all comes down to leadership and what kind of a leader you are within your business because, and your family unit, <laughs> because, yeah. um, you know, if you're a good leader, then the relationships are going to get better. But yeah. if you're a bad leader and, you know, you do kind of like what you were saying of you're just trying to abdicate or delegate because you hate doing things, uh, which it's fine to not like doing things, but mm -hmm. you have to sell it. Like, like right. it is important and it is purposeful. And it kind of brings me back to um, leadership strategies and tactics by Jocko Willink, where, you know, he pulls each t team member aside and tells them, reminds them how they're the most important person in the whole business or in the team, mm -hmm. because without them, everything else would fall apart. Yeah. And he doesn't do it to like manipulate, but he's like genuinely believes that the radio man is the most important person. Like if the radio man isn't able to, you know, call in an evacuation or backup, then the whole team dies. If the, you know, lead, I, I don't know all the different positions within military. I can't remember. But, I don't either. <laughs> but, you know, it, it is true that every single component is so important and you have to really mm -hmm. sell the vision of, yeah. of the position to um, the family member that you're working with. Uh, so I did want to ask because, you know, some people might be watching this and they're like, wow, it sounds so idyllic and great, right? And this is all assuming that your family really believes in what you're doing as an artist. Whereas a lot of families out there, a lot of people out there um, still believe in the idea of the starving artist that it's just this frivolous passion um, that's not actually going to go anywhere. And, um, you know, and of course they're deceived because, you know, I mean, if you watch this channel, then you'll understand why the starving artist doesn't, isn't, is a complete lie and a myth nowadays. But anyways, so what would you say to a parent who is trying to not just get like their kids to buy in, but their spouse or, um, their family sister as a whole or, or yeah, mom their or sister. Dad. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is a great question. I really, really believe that, uh, f first of all, families, most families, I mean, there's some extremes and we won't even talk about that, but most families really want the best, you know, for you. Mm -hmm. Even when my, my dad wasn't supportive of me and John, in his heart, he wanted the best for us. Yeah. He just was terrified two artists getting married are going to die in the streets. So... Mm -hmm. But in his heart, he wanted the best for me. So that's the first thing is families really do want the best for you. And it's just that they're afraid and they they don't think you're going to actually succeed. And that's a, hard, that's a hard thing to accept. Yeah. So your best bet is to prove them wrong and show them that you will succeed. So how do you do that before you're actually successful? Well... I would, just like any other business, I would write out a business plan and I would, you know, talk about your action steps. What are your goals for this year? Mm -hmm. What are your 90 day rocks? You know, we have um, that workshop, um, you know, predictable art success. And it was all about that. So even if you didn't watch that workshop, you could, um, you know, Google online a business plan and adapt that to your business. And for an artist, it's pretty simple. What are your three top goals this year? You know, maybe you could have up to five goals. What are your 90 day rocks that you're you're going to accomplish in the next 90 days that will get you to those goals? What are resources that you need? What are the problems that you have that you need to overcome? List it all out, put it in writing, put dates, put numbers, measurables. And when your husband or your wife or your, I mean, I feel for husbands out there that really want to make art a career and a business and the wives are like, I want, I want the steady paycheck. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for them to, to in that security, you know, be able to transition over or vice versa. Um, maybe the husband wants the wife to contribute and doesn't want her to give up her job and just go buy art supplies and, you know, yeah, they not see it as serious. a liability they, rather than an asset. That's right. Yeah. So prove them wrong on paper. Mm -hmm. Show them how it could be lucrative. Then show them, you know, this is what I'm going to make this year and this is how I'm going to do it. And then you might get their help because you'll say, 
Now, if you help me do this because you have knowledge here or you have this resource or this ability, or maybe your husband's a realtor and he knows tons of clients and you could make sketches of the people's houses every time and he could roll it into his business. I mean, mm-hmm. there's so many ways to collaborate totally. with your spouse or your extended family or your aunts, uncles, moms, dads, sisters, brothers. They all have businesses. They all know people. They have a network. If you write out your business plan and you even know what you're doing and you even know what your goals are, you will be able to find somebody in your community, in your network. There will be win-win situations where you will give them something and in return, you will get something out of it. Um, You might know somebody um, who has a particular skill that you need. Um, Maybe maybe there's a sales training and so their ideas on sales will help you. Maybe they can um, make phone calls for you and act as your art rep to get you into galleries or get you, you know, into various art shows or there's so many ways um, to use that. But I would say number one is show that you're serious and that you're thinking business wise and show them how you'll do it. And you, I I can think of one student in particular, I'm not going to say your name, but I can think of one person that her husband was completely not supportive for a very long time until she began to think about it in terms of a business Hmm. and write it down. And now he's her business manager and helping her do it. So I think you have to, you, the artist has to be serious, put it in business terms and your family will support you. Yeah. You have to take personal responsibility for You know, it can be hard, but you have to take personal responsibility for others' perception of you. And it kind of goes like contrary to what most people think, right? You're only responsible for your words and your actions and what you do, not what other people think of you. But if you're trying to get other people to buy into what you're doing, then you have to take responsibility for what they think of you because what they think of you ultimately is a result of your actions and their perception on the world. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but but it is totally true. And it's a catch-22 because if you live in this super negative environment towards your dreams, and you 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 woke up, you took the red pill and you're like, man, I don't want to go to that job I hate. I want to be free and I want a business as an artist. And you woke up to that, but your family hasn't woken up to that yet, right? And then you're you're talking about it, but in loose terms, like like pipe dream kind of verbiage, they're gonna they're gonna put you down or they might, you know, discourage you and say, ah, oh, you're just dreaming. That, that'll never happen. And then you start to believe it. And so it's like, you know, the memory of taking the red pill sort of fades thin and and now you're sort of stuck in blue pill land, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's funny. Only artists probably have any comprehension of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> like some dentist is watching going, well, dentist isn't watching, but if he was, he'd be like, what the heck is this lady talking about? But- <laughs> Uh, Artists know what that's all about. Mm-hmm. So, um, anywho, uh, yeah, I I think that it is a hard sort of spiral to get out of because you feel beaten down. You feel like your your belief in yourself is so tiny. It's it takes a lot to get that thing written down. So then what? Well, I would say get in a community of artists that are making it mm-hmm. and that are out of that sort of. Um, you know, dark, swirly spiral. And, and they, they do believe, and not only do they believe in themselves, but they believe in you. And I think that's what we try to generate, um, or, or, uh, naturally actually manifest is, is that belief, you know, and that's what I hear time and time again, uh, when I say stuff is, you know, man, you give me so much confidence because you really believe, you really believe I can do it. And you have to be around people like that. Mm -hmm. So even if being around people like that is just listening to this podcast, you know, and listen to all our podcasts. We have so many. Just listen mm-hmm. to all of them. And I'm telling you, you'll be able to make your your business plan. Yeah. Yeah. Watch all the videos on our YouTube channel. It's all free. Just by the end of that, you'll believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have two specifically that are really good for that. One, both of them kind of are, one of them is like a newer version that we filmed live. It's called the how to actually become a successful artist, I believe, or become a professional artist. So if you go on our channel, it's five steps. Um, and then we have another one that's seven steps. That's the older version of the video. We kind of uh, reframed it, made a newer version, did it live. Um, so you can find that on our channel and we'll make sure to include a link in the description of this podcast for that. But anyways, I completely agree. You have to be surrounded by the right people 
um, and, you know, supportive community in order to really thrive um, in anything that you do, you know, mm-hmm. and anything that's kind of avant-garde or um, contrary to the mainstream. Any red pill thing. Any, Yeah, exactly. Any red pill thing. So um, now what I kind of want to ask my last question is we've been mostly talking about working with a family in context to like your parent and your hiring your children. How do you think this relates to, you know, maybe people who don't have kids who aren't married um, and, you know, have all adults in their life? Yeah. Um, And is it different than what we've been saying or is it kind of the same? I think it just really depends on the family. Mm -hmm. Like if you have um, some movers and shakers in your family, I think there's win-wins in there. Um, I think though that if your family, like you're the one that's really dreaming and has a vision for your life and you're the one sort of, you know, the crab in the crab pot getting out, you know what I mean? And, and you're the one that's charging the way. It might be that, um, your family is going to be close friends that you're yet to meet. Mm. You know, really, I think almost every good business is a family business Mm -hmm. because even if, um, they're not your immediate family or blood relatives, um, or relatives at all, they're, I know almost everybody in our family, I, or our business, see, I just made a (laughs) slip, but if, if they feel like family, you know, um, you're very close, you're, because you're sharing a vision Mm -hmm. and when you share a vision, you you feel really close like family and you can have conflict and overcome that conflict and that'll just bring you closer. Mm-hmm. So I think some relatives aren't fit to be in your business. Yeah. You know, we all have them, you know, and I don't think you should involve people in your family just because they're family. They need to bring something to the table mm-hmm. and, and you need to be, you know, willing to work your butt off so that you are successful so that you can pay them and it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know that it's always the case, but I think that um, whoever you involve, you want to treat it the same way. You share your vision, just like we illustrated with Jimmy, you know, um, give them ownership, give them autonomy, um, give them a sense of purpose, accomplishment. And that that's really for any business, don't you think? Yeah, totally. Clear directions, you know, and, and you don't have to necessarily be the leader yourself. Like most people are, you know, we're just kind of coming at it from that angle because you are, you know, you establish this, you're the leader. And so I think that that's kind of like the framework from which we're looking at this, but you can also employ someone else to be the leader, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're, you're just solely focused on painting, right? And you can have your husband or your wife or one of your kids is really good at leading or integrating or being a manager. Could be your brother. Could be, Yeah. Uncle, dad. So I just, I hope that this podcast was inspiring for people. For me, I'm super excited. You know, it makes me really excited to incorporate um, our kids into the business, um, you know, five, 10 years from now. Uh, (laughs) I was just thinking about that today, actually. Yeah. I was just thinking, what if Zion's the ultimate integrator? (laughs) I know. That's what I'm like. I hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, he'll be in all the meetings. So, yeah, uh, definitely will be an unconventional, um, learning experience for him. I think, uh, growing up, uh, compared to the average schooling system. But anyways, I hope that, you know, you, the viewer, the artist, the wonderful creative that's listening to this, that's watching this, um, whatever medium, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, whatever, I hope you like this video or this podcast. Uh, And if you did, like and subscribe to this channel because we talk about all sorts of amazing things all pertaining to artists who want to be successful and who want to have a career and live a purposeful life as an artist. So if you found this really helpful, consider sending this to a family member member or a friend Mm. who's also an artist who you think this might help because you never know what one podcast can do for someone's life. You never know what one video can do uh, to change the course of someone's life. So I'm very curious what you think, the viewer, the artist who's watching this, what are your opinions on this topic? What is the biggest challenge for you to, you know, starting a family business in your art? Are you going to employ your kids? What ways, what responsibilities would you give your kids or your family members? What do you not want to do? 
How are you going to sell your stuff? How are you going to employ your family members? I'm super curious. And if you really want to do it, if you really want to make that step, write it in the comments below uh, because that's how you're going to see the action. And I'm also curious, what would you recommend to people who struggle with uh, you know, having their family buy in to their art career. So let me know in the comments below. I'm really curious. We hope you enjoyed this. Like and subscribe to the channel and we will see you in our next episode. We put out an episode for the Light Movement Podcast every Friday. See you next Friday.